Okay, Acts chapter 4. This is at the end of Peter's second sermon from last week after he healed the blind beggar. So as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men, for that a notable sign has been performed through them as evidence to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people who were all praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, now the end of that chapter is setting the stage for the next chapter, which is the story of Ananias and Sapphira next week. So that's what that's why that kind of changes. The chapter divisions are not always where we would maybe logically put them in the story, but the, once you set those things in stone, so to speak, you can't change them because everybody's Bible will be different. So sometimes verses and chapters don't necessarily make sense. So we have Peter and John speaking to the people, and now we have, oh, the bigwigs came out, because there's a big crowd, and you want to know what's what. So the captain of the temple guard, so you have the temple guard that keeps order around the temple, and 
the priests are there because they want to know what's going on. People are listening to them. John and Peter instead of the priests. And the Sadducees. And they were annoyed. Why were they annoyed? What do the Sadducees believe? Remember what those folks believe? They're, they're different. They're like the Pharisees. They're one of the group divisions. Like we have like Lutherans, Methodists, Baptists, right? So you have different groups of Jews. And the Sadducees were one of those groups. I mean, you know, maybe I remember what the... Resurrection? Right. What about it? They either did or they didn't believe. Right. So the way, the way to remember that is why are the Sadducees always sad? Because there's no resurrection of the dead. That's why they're sad, you see? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Once you're dead, you're dead. That's it. There's no heaven. There's no hell. You're dead. That's it. Which, wonderful outlook on life, right? Which is what, if you ever ask, like, what do, what do Jews today believe? Like, a lot of them, that's, they're Sadducees. They really are. So you, you still have the two big groups. You have what would be your pharisaical Jews, who are works righteous, it's all about everything you do. And there's a big group that believes once you're dead, you're dead. Uh, and I think some of your secular Jews tend that way. It's like, well, why do you got to go to the temple? Because once you're dead, you're dead. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I had a Jewish friend tell me that once. So that's kind of how it breaks down today. So the Sadducees are annoyed because they are talking about the resurrection of the dead that they don't believe in. You're giving people false hope if you tell them there's a resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them and put them in custody. But guess what? Just like with Jesus, people are believing what they're hearing. So they're hearing Peter and John, and it says about 5,000 men again. So that was the same number you had on Pentecost. I don't, don't know if there's any particular significance to 5,000. 5,000, Jesus fed 5,000 people. First Pentecost, 5,000 people came to faith. That number comes up a, a lot. But I think it's just a number. So you've got a bunch of people there who came to believe in Jesus, in the resurrection of the dead, about 5,000 people. So now they get the rulers together, the elders, the scribes. Remember, the scribes aren't just people that, they're not copyists. That's where the word scribe came from originally. But a scribe is like what we would call a doctor of the law or a doctor of theology today. So these are Jews who are doctors of theology. They brought out the brain trust, just like they did with Jesus. The scribes were there. So they bring out the scribes. Oh, and they get the high priest too. And you got Caiaphas, who was high priest when Jesus was crucified. So it's a who's who, and John and Alexander, you've got all these guys that are members of, uh, let's see. John is, I think the note, yeah, the note says John is likely the son of Annas, the successor of Caiaphas. Alexander, they don't know who he was. Uh, but the high priestly family, they are the Hasmoneans. They're just this uh, priestly family of that generation. And they put John and Peter in the middle and said, well, how'd you do it? How'd you do this? And Peter stands up to, stands up to preach, filled with the Holy Spirit, and says, well, you know, if you're, uh, if you're asking how we did this good work, you know, what did we do wrong? We healed this guy. And if that's what you're still talking about, then we did it by the, in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, that one person that you killed, that we saw raised from the dead, that guy, his name, that's how we did it. That's how he's standing before you today. And then they quote, uh, what is that? Do, 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 verse 11. Psalm 118, right? The, the, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Yeah, Psalm 118. Right, so, so Jesus, he was... The stone the builders rejected. And he actually becomes the stone upon which everything else is built, without which everything falls. Uh, so he quotes Psalm 118, which they would immediately hear and understand that there's salvation no one else. There's no other name in who you could do any of these things because there's no other name under through whom anybody could be saved. And they see, wow, these guys are, you know, They've brought out, okay, they've got the, half the army out there, right? They've got the, they've got the guards. They've got the high priest. They've got the high priest's family. They have the brain trust. They have the scribes. they got all the heavy hitters are around them. 
just like Jesus had at his trial before his crucifixion. You have all these guys standing around and are like, look how bold these guys are. Look at these guys. Look how, look how strong they're speaking. And wait a minute. These guys were with Jesus. They're just like, that guy's a fisherman. And I don't know who John is. He's just a kid, right? He's, just, he's a teenager. He's maybe 16 at this point, if you, depending on when you think he was born. You know, he was a young man. And then you have Peter, who is a bruiser, right? He's rough and tumble fisherman. He was probably the owner of the fishing company. Uh, but still, he's a bruiser. He's a brawler. And they're like, these men are not educated. Well, yeah, it depends on your definition of education. They weren't educated like a Pharisee was, right? Not like, like Paul was. You know, when we talk about Paul, Paul's a sharp cookie. He was Pharisee of Pharisees. He went to the finest theology schools the Jews had. So compared to that, yeah, Peter is an uneducated hick. But we all know people from humble places who are actually smarter than people with degrees, right? There's different kinds of smart. And these guys would have been Peter as the owner of a, a fishing couple fishing vessels. He would have to speak Greek. He would have to know his letters. He would have to know how to do some math. You know, he is not uneducated. He's not a university professor either, but calling these guys uneducated is unfair. But look who's saying it. So you've got all the sn snobby Jews, all the snobby Pharisees are standing there going, these guys are, this, this is just some kid and some hick. So, hmm. But even so, I can't really refute their argument. What am I going to say? What are they going to say against these two fellows? They can't. They're standing there and they had nothing to say. That's what Luke writes. They had nothing to say in opposition. Huh. But then they commanded them to leave the council. So they say, okay, you guys go stand over there. The grown ups have to talk. What are we going to do with them? Because it's obvious this guy's been healed and he's not. You know, he's over the age of 40, which, forgive me for not remembering what, why that is significant. Um, 40 years old. I, do not, I, don't, I don't know what it is, what the significance of that is, other than he's been crippled and everybody knows him. And he's been crippled for a while because he's not, he's not super young. So everybody, everybody knows this guy has been begging at this gate, the beautiful gate, Right. He's been begging at that gate. Everybody knows he's crippled, and now he's not. We heard them say, well, they did it in Jesus' name. We can't refute that argument. And everybody's seen it. And that's always the problem with these guys, right? What is their problem? It's not, it's not that they did it. It's just everybody's seen it, so we can't do anything to them because we're afraid what people are going to say. What, we can't punish them. Everybody goes, but they healed this guy. What's wrong with that? And we have nothing to say. And what are you going to say to that? Well, take it back. You know, make them crippled again. All right, so they can't do that. Everybody in Jerusalem has seen this guy that he's healed. So they're like, I know. We'll tell him not to do it, not to talk about that Jesus guy anymore. So they said, hey, we're going to let you go. Don't talk about Jesus anymore. And Peter doesn't shut up. They're just like, okay, see ya. No. Peter and John answered, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, that's up to you to judge, but... We can't do anything except speak about what we've seen and heard. We're eyewitnesses, and you've seen how they've, he's repeating that again. We've seen it. We saw Jesus crucified. We saw Jesus raised from the dead. We healed this guy in Jesus' name, and you saw it. Believe it. Because without Jesus in nobody else's name, can you be saved? That's what we have to say. We can't say anything else. Kind of like, because Peter, being a good Lutheran, stands up just like, Martin Luther did, here I stand, I can do no other, right? That's exactly what Peter's doing is here I stand moment. I can't do anything else other than say this. And so they, it just says they further threatened him, right? We have no way to punish him. All It's like, yeah, well, after they, you know, they admonished him not to do that anymore, they let him go. And so we can't figure out how to punish you because all the people are praising God for what happened. And hey, you can't get angry at people for praising God. You know, they're not, it doesn't say they're praising Jesus. They're praising God. Although Jesus is God, they're praising God. And they're like, well, what are Pharisees going to do? Go, don't praise God for that. Right? 
All right, so this everybody knows this guy was was crippled and now he's not. And okay, just don't do that anymore, and you guys go away. So they went to their friends, told them everything that happened to it. And so everybody's praising God. They're praying, right? Quoting more Psalms because what are the Psalms? When you don't know what to do, you go to the Psalms because the Psalms are prayers, all of them, all 150 of them, even the ones we don't like. So all 150 Psalms, even the ones that are telling you you want to see your enemies crushed, calling down God's vengeance. There are prayers. That's why God gave them to us. So that's why usually when they are lifting up their eyes and praising God, they're quoting Psalms because that's that's what you do. That's what we do. That's what a lot of our hymns are. Um, you take God's words that he gave you and you give them back to God. That's what God wants. And so uh, talks and even says, okay, who through the mouth of our father David said by the Holy Spirit and quote some more. Why did the Gentiles rage in people's plot? The kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers were gathered together. Sounds like a prophecy that we just saw enacted, right? And against the Lord and against his anointed, because at the end of the day, it was all against Jesus. It's like, okay, we thought we took care of this such situation. No, we didn't, because he's still alive and he's raised from the dead, but we don't want to admit that. And continues his prayer because, hey, we saw it. Everybody's gathered against Jesus. Herod plotted against him. Pontius Pilate got in it, into it. All the Gentiles, sorry, all the Romans, everybody. And no matter what happened, it was God's will that was carried out. Yeah, Jesus was crucified. If it wasn't the Romans, something else would have occurred so that Jesus was sacrificed. But it was God's will that the Jews conspired with the Romans, executed Jesus, and he came back from the dead. That was predestined to take place. And now, look, Lord, they're still threatening us, right? He's saying, this is what had to happen. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to do what we did today because we didn't buckle and we don't want to buckle. Continue to give us that strength while you stretch out your hand to heal, right? So they spoke the word through the Holy Spirit and give us the ability to continue to do these signs and wonders through the name of Jesus. They're not taking any credit as they shouldn't. Okay, so everything was, it's all you. Everything that's happened has been God's will, and God let it be your will. We continue speaking boldly, and that we continue to heal and continue to do these signs and wonders. And then, what happens? They're all filled with the Holy Spirit. They continue to speak the word of God with boldness, and there's an earthquake, which is weird. Where else was there earthquakes? other than the book of Revelation, because it's always when the world ends. So. Well, when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Right. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, there's there's the great shaking of the wind, right? Where else was there an earthquake? It's just it's death. death. Mm -hmm. Yep, that is death. Also, not much later, after the crucifixion. Well, when the... Uh, what was split in half when Christ died? The curtain in the Kirk temple in the Holy of Holies. All right. So you had the earthquake at Good Friday. There was also an earthquake on Easter morning. That was when the bodies came out, right? The bodies came yeah, out the of the tombs. The rock was rolled away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there was this an earth. man couldn't roll it away. Right. So you had uh, the angel roll it away. So there was an earthquake on Easter morning also. Old Testament. You it remember? Must be significant. Yeah. All it, the it, Usually when you, when God is displaying power, right? What else displays power but a good earthquake, right? So the earth shook when Jesus died. The earth shook when he returned from the dead. The earth shook just now to remind us, well, why do you think that happened? Why do you think it, there, there was a little bit of an earth shake now? Well, I think probably because... Some of the people that were there didn't believe before this miracle, before this gentleman was healed. Mm -hmm. And they saw it happen. They saw the, uh, Peter and uh, John do it. And they, then they believed because of what they heard before they got to this meeting place. They had heard about Jesus. They had heard uh, 
what he had done, his works and so on. So they saw it come to fruition right in front of them. Right, right. So this is, you know, this is just another example of God's power being displayed, just like we saw in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, uh, but different. You know, the same but different. I'm thinking of something that happened way back in Exodus. An earthquake? Mm-hmm. Is yeah. that when the Red Sea was parted? Nope. Close. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Moses was on the mountain. Well, there you go. It wasn't one of the plagues. That <laughs> yeah, was Moses on the mountain. Right. Let's see. Let's see. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Uh, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. And the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people as they break through to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near consecrate themselves, etc. Um, and don't let the people come up. And then God spoke, and God gave the Ten Commandments. So... Earthquake symbolized, you know, the earthquake didn't symbolize, the earthquake preceded God's presence coming down upon the mountain, which is then covered in smoke, so you can't see him, because if you see him, you're going to die. But, so you have earthquake, God's presence. You have earthquake, yeah, Jesus' death, God's presence. You have earthquake, Jesus' resurrection, God's presence. You have an earthquake at the coming of the Holy Spirit. God's presence. You have this little earthquake now, and it just says, you know, that the, what did it say? The, how did it say it? Uh, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. So it's like, right? Not, everything's tumbling down. So God's presence. Not like when he came down on Sinai, but it reminds you, it's like when the earth shakes, it's God doing that, right? So it's God's presence. Um, and so that's why. So you, you see these apostles here at the beginning doing these very, they're doing the same things Jesus is, had, done, had done here on earth. So Jesus raised people from the dead. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus gave sight to the blind. Jesus did all of these signs and wonders so that when he said, I'm the son of God, people go, yeah, I believe it because look at what you did. And now you have the apostles who are saying, okay, this, this guy who was lame, He's walking and running and jumping and praising God. You know why he's doing that? Because he has faith in the name of Jesus Christ. That guy you crucified, who was raised from the dead, the power, his power did that. His power did that. And by the way, we're able to do the things he did that you saw he did because, well, we saw him raised from the dead. And he sent us to proclaim this good news to you. So the apostles can do all the things Jesus could do to give them credentials as the eyewitnesses to the resurrection, which is why after the apostles, people can't do that stuff anymore. I, I can't raise people from the dead. I can't, my shadow doesn't heal people when it touches them, right? I'm not Peter. I don't have that power because once the apostles passed, the church has begun, the good news is being proclaimed. They don't have to. You don't have to have that, that office of apostle cease to be because you once the- Do believe in the laying on of hands? Absolutely. I mean, does it, do I believe I have the miracle of healing when I do that? It's the power of prayer. That's all that is. You know, and that's actually not for pastors to do. Do you know that? You know, we're supposed to, you know, if anyone's sick, let the elders go and anoint them with oil. That's not pastors. That's men in the congregation. Go to people's house when they're sick and anoint them with oil. But yeah, I do. I do. I do do oil. But yeah, that's actually one of the things that's not talking about pastors. It actually says for the elders of the congregation to go to people and do that. But that's all, it's power of prayer. And prayer has, we've seen it. You know, we've seen the, the miracle of healing that people get uh, from prayer. He absolutely answers prayer, just not the way we necessarily want him to sometimes. 
And absolutely none of those idiots on TV that are trying to heal people do. Like, man. You know, it doesn't even look real, you know? I went to a faith healing service one time with somebody just so that they had company. I didn't want them to go by themselves or, you know. Strictly for the experience? So what was that like? Fake. Mm. It was a Catholic church. Um, yes. When? Uh, it was Indian independence. Um, you know, like when, though? Yeah. Like 30 years ago. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, see, there was that charismatic movement that ripped through like Catholicism and Lutheranism too. And you still hear remnants of that in some congregations. So it's fun, it's interesting to me to go into churches that have libraries and go to down in their library and see what books are on the shelf. Because it tells you at least the time those books got put there, like what the general consensus was in the congregation. Uh, so you'll see like, you know, like charismatic stuff these people that were like really into the faith healing because they had somebody breeze through town and they opened up the church. Oh, hey, come to our church and do that. They'd get a lot of people in. Or, uh, you know, like you go to a church and half the books on the shelf are by Billy Graham. <laughs> Billy Graham's got some good stuff. I'm just saying. You go to a Lutheran church and there's no, like you don't see any Luther on the shelf, but you see a bunch of Billy Graham books that tells you what people were into at that time. And there was a lot of that in like the 70s and 80s. That was a big thing. So yeah, yeah. So you had that charismatic movement where you have fake healing. Yeah, there's still a lot of that. Put your hands on the television. Who did that? Where you send them money? If you put your hands on the television, and I will pray that for you, and you'll the be here. Was it? Was it Tower of Power? No. Was that? Was, was that wasn't Oral Roberts? Was it? Oh. Oral Roberts. I saw six hundred foot Jesus. It, but no, I don't yeah. think it was him. But it was like there that gener it was that generation. But yeah, if you send me if you send money and put your hands on the television set, and I'll heal. You're like, okay. Yeah, um, they star here. They're doing it now. Um, they've had. Oh, I tell you. Um, oh, senior moment. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they're the other one. on some Monday dish. You and God want you to prosper, you know. Rex Humbug started all that stuff way back, and that might be. Yeah, Rex Humbert was. Yeah, he was here the first ones, yeah. yeah. You may not have known him. He was out of the Akron area. There's a guy that, of, now that's uh, on TV. He's a, appears to be some kind of Arab. His name, last name is Yusuf. But what he has been saying, he follows Charles Stanley you know, on TV and seems to be squared away in what he's saying. You know. But he, he, as far as I noticed, he just showed up here in the last mm. six months, maybe. His That's last something. name is Jerusalem? Hmm? No. Yosef, I think you said. Yusuf. Yusuf? Oh, Yusuf. Y-O-U-S-E-F. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I haven't heard him say anything. It's too crazy. Yeah, so these, so Peter, Peter and John are being pretty bold here. I mean, that's, they're not you know, like. Isn't it ironic? The last time Peter was kind of surrounded by these same guys, he was kind of a little on the outside that day. But when was the last? When was the last time Peter had an opportunity to be that bold? So, when Jesus was being. Aren't Christ you one of his disciples? Right. I know. You're, I can tell by your accent you're Galilean, so you were with him, right? No, I don't even know who he is. I don't. I don't know the man. Yeah. So he's come like, boom, like 180 degrees. Because like right now, they could have they could have taken him off. I mean, they could have probably found the local Romans and like had him arrested and beaten, right? They well, didn't. No, they couldn't do that because my my Bible has a footnote saying it was near the end of the day. The gates were closed at 4 p.m. And uh, they would just have to let them go till the next day because no one could be arrested after dark. Right, mm -hmm. right. So they so have to they follow the laws. But they could have not gone back the next day, but they did, right? So they could have gotten them the next day. All I'm saying is Peter's behavior could have been the same, but it didn't. It's completely the opposite now. Of course, witnessing the resurrection kind of maybe changes and your mind a little bit. The Holy Spirit and having a little whammy of the Holy Spirit, absolutely. So but it just I see the same people congregating around them, 
right? This like that didn't bode well for Jesus when they arrested him, and it's not shouldn't bode well for these guys. But they're like, yeah, no, don't do that anymore. Okay, well, yeah, we're going to do that again. We're going to stand right back up and say the exact same thing. You know, so there's a big, big difference. You know, you just see these guys like why? Why are these guys? You know, why is Luke running? Trying to figure out how they were going to maintain control. Right, right. So you have. So you have the apostles, you know, acting in this way, obviously because they are, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit. But, you know, they're still, it's not safe. It's still not safe for them to be doing this. Yes, but since it was late in the day and they couldn't be arrested, so if they came back the next day, you know what was going to happen. They were going to bring more people with uh, uh, injuries or... Oh, sure. And so then the priests in the Sanhedrin and everybody would see more miracles performed. Yeah, so they're just going to go, well, we ought to arrest them, but, you know, they keep healing people. So, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a catch-22 for them. But, but they're, being, you know, they're being pretty bold. This is, this is a strong, strong beginning. Uh, and it's just interesting to me to see. And Peter says the same thing for... Truly in this city were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, Herod, Pilate, the Gentiles, the people of Israel. But then he reaffirms, because it was your will that this take place. And right now, we're walking out free, preaching the gospel and healing people, because that's your will too. Right? So their faith is solid. That just what a contrast to just prior to the crucifixion. And, you know, well, you God gives it a little reassuring, boom, yeah, I'm right here. Well, wouldn't, wouldn't your faith be strong, though, if you saw Jesus killed in the manner in which he was, and then he came back to life, and you got to see him and talk to him? Wouldn't that... I, I, mean, I would have to say that would be a formative of them were thing. Oh, yeah. for their faith. Yeah. Okay? If that weren't true... If that didn't happen, if Jesus didn't come back from the dead, would they have given up their lives for a lie? Absolutely no. not. And that's one of the great arguments for when people try to tell you the resurrection never happened. They all say, okay, here's the story of these 11 fellows, every single one of them who was executed for his faith. No one under torture, and, and they were these were torturous mm -hmm. deaths, right? No one under torture is going to die for something they know is a lie. Now, you will believe, you will die for something you believe is the truth, if it, even if it's not true, but you believe it's true. Suicide bombers, okay, they believe in what they think is going to happen, and that is why they blow themselves up. But no one, oh, well, the, the, the apostles were in on the conspiracy. Jesus never died, he just passed out. Or, well, you know, they stole the body and hid it, and then they just. But like, that, in a case like that, he'd have to die again. Yeah. <laughs> but but the thing is, it's like okay, so the apostles are in this conspiracy. No one dies for a conspiracy under torture. No one. It's, if you know something's a lie, you're not going to die for it. Absolutely not. Unless I mean, you'd have to be some kind of insane. But you don't die for something you know is a lie. No one does. Not that kind of death. Not that kind of torture. And if you look at how those 11 guys, John died of old age. Uh, if you look how all these other guys and some of the early martyrs died, it's horrific. You know, you have like uh, Matthew crucified, Peter crucified, Andrew crucified. Uh, Peter was upside down. Peter was upside down, traditionally by request. Uh, but that was also actually a form of crucifixion. So all the different forms of crucifixion that are described, those are, the Romans had more than one way, which is horrific to read about too. Uh, boiled in oil, sawn in half. I mean, poisoned and then boiled in oil. Uh, John tradition says they tried to boil him in oil and he wouldn't cook. And then... They did, what else did they do? Too? They, they tried to boil him in oil and he wouldn't I die. They, they tried to, yeah, that was Paul. Paul was poisoned and he wouldn't die. But yeah, I think John was poisoned and he wouldn't die. Boiled in oil and he wouldn't die. They tried to burn in a mistake and he wouldn't die. He wouldn't burn. And they finally like, yeah, okay, prison. Didn't know what to do with him. That's all legend. Uh, 
But look at all the things that happened to Paul, and he didn't die either, and that's in the Bible. Uh, yeah, so you have all these horrific ways, if the traditions are true, and they were actual execution methods and torture methods. None of these guys would have done that. They would at some point have gone, yeah, we, yeah, I'm a liar. Nobody would do that. And every single one of them to a man, plus all the other early martyrs, including Stephen, who we'll get to in a couple of weeks, uh, nobody, nobody will sit and take that, knowing that you're lying. So, yeah. And that many martyrs just doesn't happen. And that's why I always say, when, and that, that's one of your arguments against people that say the resurrection never happened, that they, well, they didn't actually see him. Like, yeah, they did. They kind of did, and they kind of believed it, and that's why they kind of went to that kind of death. Because they, know, they knew what they saw was true. They believed. That's probably, that's probably a good stopping place. The, all of these people, it doesn't say how many of them are, it just says all of them were of one heart and soul. And everybody said, what's mine is yours, basically. Um, which some people like to cherry pick that and said, see, you know, communism. It's like, no, it's not communism. You know, so they shared everything. They had everything in common. Uh, un church unity in every respect. Hey, it's the early days. <laughs> Sin hadn't really got its fingers in the early church yet to screw everything up, which we see over the next 2,000 years, oh, right? You know, they still all believe, yeah, Jesus raised from the dead. And you believe in that, you have everything you'll ever need, right? So there's complete unity. It's beautiful. So when when it's saying that, is that including the priests and the temple guards and all those people who were standing around watching? No, now they're just talking about the Christians. Oh, okay. Yes, because when they were released, they went to their friends and reported everything they said. Uh, so they went back to wherever the rest of the group was. So they were at the temple. They had this big okay, and they showdown. Just yeah. Went back to their own people and reported all. Of it. Yes. So okay. where, wherever they're staying. So they have community property. They're selling all their stuff. Uh, they're all owning it together. So you have perfect unity of doctrine, and they had everything in common. They shared everything with one another. Um, they just believed that this is what they should do. Uh, and that's all that means. They shared everything. And they uh, believed everything in common. Uh, which we'll then see start to go bad. And actually you'll see it go bad in the next chapter. It's like, yeah, everything's perfect now, but wait. Of course. Yeah. Sin enters in. Sin enters into <laughs> everything. So, uh, And that they were held in, what did it say? They said they were held in, did they say they were held in high esteem or with great power? There. So there was powerful preaching, first of all. I like, the, I like the Lutheran Study Bible note, which I find it slightly offensive. It says, with great power, the apostles were uh, giving their testimony of the resurrection and great grace was upon them all. So great grace upon them all, that doesn't mean like grace from above. Grace means they were, that actually means, that word there means uh, people held them in high esteem. It's like, hey, look at those guys. Look how great they're getting along. Like, that's, that should be an example to us. That's how you want to live. Wonder what's different about them. Well, let me tell you about Jesus, right? Uh, it said, uh, the preaching was the opposite of dull, distant reading from a manuscript. So shame on you. You should memorize your sermon every Sunday. <laughs> if I tried to do that, I don't have the courage to get up there and do that. I mean, I know what I wrote. But I'm, if I got up there without a manuscript, I'd just be like looking at you going, I don't remember what I was going to say next. It, my brain don't work that, doesn't work that way. Some people can't. I can't do that. I don't want to try to do that. <laughs> but does anybody that reads for that's why I don't like that note. <laughs> Dull, distant reading from a manuscript. <sighs> Which brings up a little comment um, from Sunday. Uh, there was one person in the car out in the parking lot and... <coughs> said that the reception was not good. It depends where they park, because I have people every week say, oh, the reception was perfect. Okay, Nothing so they changes. They need to go down. Yeah, they, they need to. The windows they, are. Yeah, they maybe need to be. The best place to park is right out, right across from the pulpit. Okay. Not there, because it's the transmitter's right there. I have to tell her that. But yeah, it's, uh, it should cover the whole parking lot, but again, radio waves are funny. Yes. But 
didn't mean to. No, that's all right. Yeah, because I, I have because I'll have people in cars next to each other. And it's like oh, it sounds terrible. It's like well, listen to ours. It's perfect, and it depend. It doesn't depend on how new the car is or that. It's just they're right next to each other. This one gets it. This one doesn't. There's no rhyme or reason to it. And he can't do more power because any more power is a no no. <laughs> it's as much power as I can have without having an FCC license. Possibly a little more, but. That's all a unit is capable of. So that's the ultimate goal is to have an FCC license? No. <laughs> you know, that's, that's just what I need in my life, more rules and regulations. It's kind of like I wanted to get into flying quadcopters. You have to, the license, you have to, everybody has to have a license for it now. What is that? Uh, drones, the little drones. Oh, oh, okay. You fly them over a certain height, you need FAA. Well, no, you own the airspace on your property that you own. You own up to 350 feet. So if you're on, if you're within your boundary, your property boundary up to, it's either 350 or 450, you can go up. That's your airspace. Beyond that, yeah, you have to have a license, which means you have to register, and then they want to know what you're dealing with. And, 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 and. So we have to guesstimate if your drone is within 350 feet before we shoot it down. Right. Well, where I live, you don't have to worry about that because if you fly your drone about 300 feet above your house, the eagles will come and take it out of the air. <laughs> have you seen those videos? No. If people fly their drones up and a, a bald eagle comes by, they don't like those things because they think it's a threat and they'll they take them to the ground. It's like, boom! <laughs> and we've got a couple, so. We've got many, so, yeah. So you can't... I feeding them. <laughs> I guess, because those, those nests are huge. Yeah, you'll see every now and then you'll see cars lined up on Heisley Road there, because that's what they're all looking at is uh, the big eagles' nests in the trees. So, is that in the headlands, the um, marsh, marsh area? Yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah, it's on 44 on the 44 North on the left hand side there. And there's a bunch of all the trees on the uh, edge of the road there, back in the excuse me, back in the marsh before the swamp starts. It's all eagles' nests, like tons wow. of them. We'll have to drive over there, Chad. Bring it's, your binoculars. Be sure you know where we're going, because I've not, Peter's not. Yeah, like, well, like, like here's Heisley Road, and here's Headland State Park. Okay. Okay, when you get to state the park, go back the other way you came, and then those trees on the right side of the road, that's where they all are. Yeah, wait another month or so when the leaves, more leaves are down, and you'll actually be able to see the nests. They're like this big, they're huge. But yeah, so that's where we'll stop this week. So, not a needy person among them. They were all, as many, so it's like everybody sold, as many as were owners of lands or houses. So they all, if they owned property, they all sold it, brought it to the apostles, and then everybody shared it which is great in a perfect world, but that is to contrast what's gonna happen next. And that's why they made a big deal of talking about Joseph, who was called Barnabas, who was a Levite, right? So he was a member of the priestly class, so he's probably a convert, right? Jewish convert to Christianity, sold a field and brought the money, all of it, laid at his disciples' feet. So he did that, all of the money, because somebody is going to not give all the money. And that's what we'll talk about next week. Hopefully I get a better reaction out of you guys than I did out of my confirmation class. We did Ananias and Sapphira last Sunday in confirmation class. I said, did you, read, did you guys read anything in this story that struck you as odd? And they said, no. And there's like two really odd things. You know, the first one is, and the second one is later. It was like, no, you, you guys didn't think any of that was odd? No. Well, how about this? This happened. Did you think that was odd? No. Okay. And what about what happened in the Ananias and Sapphira? Did you think that was a hot? Like, do you think that was like a little harsh? Well, no. But okay. <laughs> so you guys watch too many violent movies if you think that's okay. They accepted it just like, well, yeah, that's what you get. <laughs> okay. Okay. They expect God to be smitey, I guess. Yeah.